live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE, covering Enterprise Connect 2019. Brought to you by Five9. Hello from Orlando, we are at Enterprise Connect 2019 and we are being very graciously hosted by Five9, which is the Intelligent Cloud Contact Center. We've had a great few days, Stu Miniman and myself, talking with um, customers, partners, vendors on this massive change in enterprise communication and collaboration. And we're excited to welcome back to theCUBE one of our alumni, Zias Caravella, the founder and principal analyst at ZK Research. Zias, it's great to have you here. It's awesome to be here. You are, you should have VIP status yeah, at Enterprise Connect <laughs> because you have been to this event some 20 times. Yeah, I believe it's my 20th. I can't Enterprise imagine, Connect. so they didn't, they should roll out the red carpet. Maybe we'll put a note in. Yeah, well, next year. But yeah, there you go. I want to get my own booth. There you go. <laughs> but I can't imagine how much this event has changed and just your perspectives on day three here of EC19 and some of the vendors that you're like, wow, a few years ago, you would never have seen a so-and-so here. Yeah, the show's massive compared to what it used to be. The, I remember when I first started coming, the show floor was maybe, if, I, if it was a quarter the size, I'm being generous. And it was really dominated by just a handful of companies. But since then, it's gone through several transitions uh, to IP, to software, to the cloud. Uh, and that's gotten a lot more companies interested. And I think also, uh, finally, businesses are starting to understand that if you're going to transform digitally, right, communications has to be part of that. In fact, if you look at any piece of research, right, I know there's a Walker study thrown around saying that by 2020, customer experience will be the number one brand differentiator. That's, that's already happening. It's already the number one brand differentiator. And so because of that, more and more companies are now interested in communication. So you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we didn't have Amazon here, we didn't have Microsoft here, we didn't have Oracle here, but it's been a great thing for the show to see all these other companies that really have really great IT presence validate what we've been saying for a long time. And it's, it's a much different show today than it was. Yeah, it, it, it's really interesting. The, the thing that opened my eye is uh, some of the companies that are here, I wish I knew which brands use these technologies so that if and when I do have an issue, <laughs> I'm not going to have that horrible customer experience that you know, we've had in the past before. Yeah. It's like, you know, if I wanted to make a call, it's like, can I even make a call? And you know, do I actually get through the IVR or things like that? Um, I like how you set it up. There's some of these pendulum swings, some of these waves of technology. Um, let's talk a little bit about voice, because yeah. this used to be called VoiceCon, and it went through a rebranding because you know, voice was in a little bit of decline, yeah. but you know, we know voice is, is still very important. How does that fit in the whole Well, it went through that reband. Frankly, voice wasn't sexy anymore. Yeah. Everyone was talking about unified communications. No one was going to call anybody ever again. We were just going to message or social each other to death. <laughs> and uh, what's happened is voice is kind of important, right? And I, I think one of the interesting trends to look at is that voice is becoming simultaneously less important and more important. And what I mean by that is, uh, it may sound like a little bit of an oxymoron, but if you look across uh, all age demographics, right? They're, everybody has a preferred mode of communications. And it's rarely voice to start a conversation with a company. You, you message them, you social them, send them an email. But somewhere in there, you, you eventually want to talk to somebody. And at that moment, uh, so to start the conversation, voice is less important. But at that moment, you now want to have a conversation with an educated agent who knows what your problem is and can help you quickly. And so now voice is more important than it's ever been before. Where, but I think the, the barrier to entry wasn't all that high. But voice is, you know, it's, it's important, it's sexy. And especially when people are dealing with emotional issues, they're dealing with money problems, right? If I'm trying to get a refund, uh, if I'm trying to check on the status of my health, I want to talk to somebody. But when I want to talk to somebody, I want to get that conversation with over as possible. And I think the, the bar has been raised. As you mentioned, Stu, you used to think that the dreaded IVR, if you have a dreaded IVR experience, you just won't do business with that company anymore, right? And so the, 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 the stakes are higher and the bar has been raised on what voice is. Are you seeing that the customers that you were talking to are now starting to get much more prescriptive in terms of understanding their customer journeys and their preferences with, you know, before they used to go, oh, we assume we're talking to millennials, they only want yeah. They only want uh, to SMS or email. Are companies starting to get more focused on, all right, let's actually do analysis and determine if we're voice only, what are the next channels that we need to enable? Uh, well, I wish they were. <laughs> I, I think we're, we're really in the early, early innings of that. I think the best companies in the world are doing that. If you look at companies with very high 
uh, uh, NPS scores and customer SAT scores, they're doing that thing already, and I think it's a good lesson for the rest of the industry. If you're not doing that, you're going to fall behind pretty quickly. And uh, I think that is driving companies more to this omni-channel experience where uh, from, a, uh, from an analytics standpoint, you really have to understand your customer, not at the demographic level, but almost at a custom level, because everyone's different. Right, I, I think that's, uh, that's never been possible before, but today because we've got bigger data sets, things are in the cloud, the rise of artificial intelligence, it's made all this stuff possible. And so companies, like I said, the best companies in the world are taking advantage of it, and they're having you know, big differences. That's why there's been such huge swings in the market leadership, right? The companies we never heard of before are market leaders, and brands we trusted and loved before, are, they're gone. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because every company we talked to this week, that, that CX is at the center of what they're talking about. So, in your research, what is differentiating those, those new leaders and you know, causing some of those swings in the marketplace? How, how does the customer look at these and help differentiate an in in ever-changing ever marketplace? Well, it's, what's going on today, it's really about being more contextual, having a deeper understanding of why your customer's calling, uh, how you can help them faster, understanding maybe what products they own, uh, you know, what, what are some of the adjacent ones. Uh, and I think that's going to very quickly become table stakes. And I think where we're moving to is we're going to shift customer service from being largely inbound driven and reactive, and that's where AI can help react faster, to being more outbound driven and proactive. Right, so for instance, let's say I buy a connected refrigerator and my water filter needs changing. Well, right now I still have to recognize that and maybe I call that refrigerator company and they can proactively help me because they understand what I have and they've got a great omni-channel contact center. But ultimately that should be reversed. They should contact me maybe through a text message saying, hey, we noticed your water filter needs changing, can we send you one? I, yes, it comes. And then maybe I call the agent and say, can you help me install it? Right, and so I think within the next three, four years, we're going to see a lot of customer service uh, uh, where contextual is the table stakes and then the ability to predict what your customer wants, that's going to be the differentiator. And frankly, that's really exciting. I mean, it, it's, uh, if you think we've seen change in this industry, as you mentioned in the last five years, wait for the next five. When you're talking with customers or even doing research in, in other venues, Stu mentioned CX, we talk, we've been talking about it all week. But I get curious when I hear the customer experience and the agent experience, I just think how are they not, how are they separate? Because if the agent isn't empowered to be able to, whether it's know the right channel that I want to be communicated with, or have the information or the context about why I'm calling, then the customer experience, right? Yeah, well they're very tightly linked together. You can't have a good customer experience without a good agent experience. And you may have the best trained agents in the world that are the most empathetic, that are, are, are uh, incredibly sensitive what, to what people want, but if they don't have the data, you're going to frustrate your customer. And everybody's been through that situation where you get transferred to somebody else and you got to start that whole conversation over again and eventually you just hang up and say, I don't want to ever do business with you. So I, I think the, you're right, agent experience and customer experience are very tightly interwoven and they're, they're really dependent on one another. You can't, you can't do without the data. And again, that's where all these trends of AI come into play because they're able to send better information to the agents faster, uh, really through an assistive technology versus replacement, right? So, uh, when we came into this show, we knew that the wave of cloud had made a big transformation. Yeah. We're starting to hear AI is the, the next wave everybody's talking about. Uh, I, I believe I read something uh, that, that you had written that was talking about you know, whether that AI is something just internal that the company builds in versus how it interacts with the customer. W where do you see AI having the, the biggest impact kind of in the short term and where, where, where is it more long term? It's a great question because I ask my customers all the time, should we be using intelligent bots? Or if you saw the Google Duplex demo where they have uh, an AI call and order pizza, I think it was, or something like that. So is AI ready to talk to people? And I think if you think of the entire world of interactions on a two by two grid, and as an analyst we like two by two grids, right? And you put complexity of conversation on one axis and uh, frequency of interactions, if it's, high com if it's low complexity, high frequency, that might be okay to try and automate through a bot. Other than that, everything should flip to agent. And I, I think right now, uh, we're very early in the AI cycle, and so as a business, I'm not sure I trust the AI to always have the right answer. Right? But 
it makes a great assistive technology to recommend to the agent, this is what you should say. And the great thing about that is, if the agent says, no, that's stupid, and says that wasn't helpful, that becomes the input to the learning mechanism for the AI. So over time, it'll get smarter and smarter. But if you, if you want to think about just the role of it now, uh, I always use the analogy, it's like a self-driving car. I'm not sure if either one of you would want to jump in a car that has no driver, no steering wheel, no controls. But there's a lot of great AI technology in a car, like lane change assist, parallel parking assist, things like that, that can make you a better driver. So let's make our agents better drivers by giving them those assistive technologies. And that's the, the, the short term vision. Long term, who knows? But I, but I think uh, if companies are too aggressive with AI, they're actually going to uh, create an, the opposite effect where they hurt customer experience. It's the people that make a difference, so let's make those people better. And that's one of the things that we've heard consistently throughout this event is the empathy factor that the machines can't bring, that it's really got to be the humans with the AI to deliver an ideal, hopefully optimal experience to whatever customer has whatever issue on the back end. Yeah, in fact, uh, Rowan always talks about that as well, the CEO of Five9, and, and I think he's right from that regard. It is uh, about having the knowledge of the customer and the empathy to understand, put yourself in the customer's position. And this, to your point, Lisa, about CX and um, uh, Asian experience being tied to, coupled together, if the Asian is stressed because they don't have the right information and they're trying to message this person or look something up in a database, that frustration is going to come through to the customer. And that further frustrates the customer, right? So if the agent's armed with the right information, they can spend more time focused on the customer and less time trying to find the data that frankly, they should have at their fingertips all the time. Yeah, so speaking of Five9, uh, you recently attended their analyst event. I did. And uh, we, we've had the executives on the team, uh, you know, Jonathan on uh, earlier this week, you know, rock star background. We're going to have Rowan on a little bit later. We know him from his Cisco days. Without breaking any NDAs, you know, give us a little bit of the insight as to uh, you know, Five Nines, you know, what have they been doing well, what's, what's the new team driving them forward towards? Well, I mean, if you look at their stock price from, since Rowan joined, it's, it's more than doubled. So obviously there's some, some good growth there. I, I think one of the, I've always believed that it's very difficult to compete on product alone, right? And if you believe this whole world of it is customer experience, that's what they do really well. They, the customers, their customers have a great experience dealing with Five9. They have a great service organization that makes sure that when you buy Five9, you have a good onboarding experience, that it's set up the way you want it, and that services business makes a big difference. Now, they've always had that. Now, where I think the new executive team has made a difference is helping the company understand the scale, move up market to more enterprises, because the needs there are different than down market. And so I think, um, you know, they're going to have a big impact on the future uh, of Five9. Frankly, I think a lot of what you've seen for growth in the last year has been stuff that was put in place, but I know they're working on a lot of AI capabilities without breaking any NDAs. I can tell you that the, um, the demonstrations that Jonathan Rosenberg, who's an incredibly smart guy, I mean, he might be the smartest guy in this industry, um, was giving around how AI can impact customer experience, was the best set of concrete examples that I've seen today because it's really easy to give me pie in the sky, hypothetical things, but he really boiled it down at a very granular level of this is possible, this is possible, and I'm expecting over the next year, five, nine customers will see those things. They've done really well in the enterprise market. I think last year in 2018, they closed um, very, very strongly. Also, a lot of growth in their custom, enterprise customers with a million in ARR plus. What are you seeing though in terms of some of the smaller businesses that probably are facing a lot of the same challenges that enterprises are? Is this an area where they can also leverage Five9 to really dial up and deliver great CX? Yeah, well the line has moved up, right? Are people interested in cloud services? It used to be just small businesses and, and now it's all kinds. But I think for a small business, um, you can look like a much larger business. I, I think there's a lot of companies, some, people sometimes think that's a little risky to deal with a small company. But Five9 is a very, very valuable tool because by having that information right away at an agent's fingertips, they're able to actually replicate a large company experience and, and almost validate that the customer made the right decision using them. So I, uh, I, I think up and down the stack at, uh, uh, for Five9, they provide value to companies of all sizes today. Uh, one of the, you know, the interesting aspects of what I've seen too is everybody talks about uh, this $24 billion TAM for contact center. I actually think it's a lot bigger than that. I've, and, um, and, I, and I say that because that $24 billion TAM is based on giving contact center people contact center tools. But what I've been noticing over the last year is when people buy Five9, often it's not contact center people using it. Using it. It's salespeople, marketing people, 
field service, <clears throat> anybody that needs the customer info is using it. And I'll give you an example. One of the customers that was at the 5.9 day, I can't see who they, say who they are, they migrated all 50 contacts and agents to 5.9, and since then they've added 100 more salespeople using their, uh, the tools. So now we've got 150 people using 5.9 when there was only 50 contact center agents. So you can see the, the value is starting to spread across the company. And I think that's a pretty exciting thing. Yeah, it's been, been interesting. Uh, we, we've seen at the show and in some of the interviews that line between kind of unified communications and, and contact center seems to be blurring. It yeah. uh, seems to be that that's the thing. Well, everybody saying. needs that data and the customer info. I actually think TAM is closer to 40, 45 billion, to be frank. Really, every, anybody who uses a CRM tool should have five, nine capabilities. Zias, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your energy on day three of Enterprise Connect 19. We appreciate your time. Thank you. First to Miniman, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE. <laughs>